they can let go of your favorite rep and they can cut the marketing budget if they don't think it's merited for the business. These are the risks that you have to face going into the process, but it's a part of that trust relationship you're building when you're trying to decide who's the right partner for the company. Welcome back to another episode of Inorganic. My name's Christian Hasseld. I'm your host, and this is episode 11, running a do-it-yourself sale process. The question that we're going to explore on this episode is if you're a founder, CEO, president, CFO, and you've concluded that you need to sell the company, but for whatever reason, you don't want to hire a banker, too expensive, company's not big enough, whatever that reason is, if you want to run the process, like what does that look like? How does it work? Today, I have with me on the show a very special guest, John Gregg. He is the former president of Sellpoints. And he ran his own DIY sale process several years back, and he is going to come on the, the mic here and tell us the story. So let's get underway. John, welcome to the podcast. Christian, good to see you. Thanks for having me on today. Yeah, this is an exciting topic, and I know we've got some, some good shared history around it. Happy to, uh, happy to be here, man. Yeah, yeah. I liked uh, a little bit of an inside scoop for our listeners. Uh, at the time that John was exploring the sale of his company. I was running corporate development at a public company called Channel Advisor. Uh, I talked to John as a part of like, my job and we're, I kind of qualified this as an oper potential opportunity. It, it, uh, we qualified it out for uninteresting reasons. It wasn't really a, a fit with our business. So there's a little more familiarity with this process. It's kind of exciting several years later to come together and, and talk about how it went down and how it all worked out. So John, maybe just to get it started for our listeners, could you give them a little bit of background on yourself, where you are right now and kind of where you've been? You're a very successful operator. So I'd love to kind of hear the story. Yeah, sure. My pleasure. Um, the last couple of years I've spent leading our uh, client development team and new business team at Syndigo, uh, specifically focused on our mid-market and small business segments. So really commercially minded, um, go-to-market uh, focused uh, Syndigo offers a, a wide array of services uh, and offerings to customers in the, the retail commerce space, but really laser focused, if you will, on content syndication um, and enterprise data solutions. So that's been the last couple of years. Um, prior to that, had spent some time in agricultural technology out in the farms, out in the fields, um, leading uh, go to market functions at a company called Ceres uh, and before that at Cellpoint. So you know, I really love to get in with teams that are evolving, uh, growing through transformational stages. Sometimes that results in an M&A transaction, and sometimes it results in other phases of growth. Um, but that's been the, the recent past. Cool. Awesome. Great intro. Um, so, like, let's get into it. The odds of being able to successfully exit a SaaS company in this day and age, um, they're pretty small. Uh 90% of exits are strategic, meaning another buyer picks up a company, 10% are IPO, but it's like low, low, low single digits, two to 3% of companies actually exit at all. So to be a founder that is able to navigate successfully a sales process puts you in a special class in and of itself. And to run that process is an extra level of crowning, which both John and I have uh, the pleasure of, of that experience, the pleasure and probably the wild ride that is that experience. So John, maybe the first thing to explore with our listeners is how did you come to the conclusion uh, that it was time to sell? Was it a, a board decision? Like what sort of led to the um, decision to sell the company in the first place? You know, uh, great question. And the, those odds are, those odds are intimidating now looking back at it and thinking about the, the success rate of, uh, of transacting a, a private company, certainly a SaaS business in today's day and age. So it's not an easy decision to, to realize that you're going to need to transact the business wholly and find and acquire um, and throw your hat in the ring. And, and that's uh, the way the process went down, at least from my perspective, was we looked at the market. We looked at who we were. We looked at our investor expectations. You read the tea leaves and make a strong recommendation to the deciding powers, to the board. And you make a strong decision that says, based on our trajectory, who we are, what our identity is, and what your capital requirements are, all of it, Christian, come together to objectively look at the reality that says our highest and best path is a transaction rather than raise more money, liquidate other percentages of the company, 
really find the right home. And I'm sure we'll get into what finding the right home looks like. Um, but that was a that was a decision that the board needed to make and sign off on. I was just you know the president who made the the recommendation, um, and then that that kicked off a series of discussions with the board, and they they ultimately thought that was the right way to go, and we crossed our fingers um, before we jumped on board. The way the way you're speaking is is that of an experienced operator, mm -hmm. where you kind of distinguish the governance role that the board has, the role of the investors, and your role as the operator, and sort of making a a less of an emotional decision and more of a principled decision about what's right for the constituents at the table. And a lot of times if you're a founder or you're a CEO who's kind of really attached to the company, you might get a little bit more invested in it. And it leads to a lot of different things. And one of those things can be, you sort of say, well, we'll, we'll think, we'll try, we'll dip our toe in the pool. We might try to sell. It's a, it's, you really, this is something you really have to commit to do. And one thing I hope we get out of this conversation is the material amount of commitment of time, if not just you, but people around you to make this a success. If you go in it with just sort of like, we'll see what happens. You're always putting, you're, you're always creating the potential for risk that you won't maximize value for your investors, or you'll create a lot of confusion for the market and potentially uh, sabotage the process and any opportunity to do so anytime in the near future. So I hope that's something that we take away from what you just said. I, I'm kind of stretching it out a little bit because the, the making that decision is really important. Particularly with, I think, uh, a DIY process. Um, I've been a, um, a leadership team member with other organizations where we've looked at working with bankers to help lead transactions and such. But particularly, Christian, with a DIY process. The, the resources, the commitment, the there is no plan B mindset, if you will. If you're going to make the decision that you need to transact the company and find the best path for investors, team members, customers, all constituents at the table, it requires an inordinate amount of your time. All operators, time, uh, supporting lieutenants, all the functional leaders that are key to the process, you're doing it yourselves. And so, you know, David Goggins, um, readers, listeners may be familiar with David Goggins, but he's got this phrase, um, when you're committing to go somewhere and you get that direction, you make sure you burn your boats so there's no looking back. You can't be 70, 80, 90% of the way in with something like this. It requires all of your focus, extreme commitment to believe in what you're doing um, across the board, board, investors, lead operator, all of your lieutenants, because it's nights. Nice. It's weekends, you're cold calling, you're outreaching, you're putting together your pitch decks, you're going to meetings, you're flying around the country and you're operating the business at the same time. So you have to believe in the process and commit fully and, and recognize it's going to be an incredibly exciting, incredibly trying opportunity that you're up for. Um, as long as you band the team together and, and, and you're all aligned, you can get there. I, I don't, I don't think we can fully appreciate in the couple of minutes we're just on this part of the conversation the psychology of on the one hand pitching new business and trying to you know get upsell and new logo well on the other side of the building you're selling the company the ownership even your role may not be the same in 60 or 90 days it's a it's a very weird uh place it's a natural feeling to feel weird uh, to just sort of feel like, wow, this feels weird. You almost feel dirty, but um, this kind of leads into sort of the goals of the process. And I'll, I'll spoil one of your answers, which is one of the goals that frequently doesn't get to the top is the best outcome for the customers. If you could, John, could you kind of uh, walk through what were the goals of the process in your mind from the operator perspective? So first and foremost, it started with maximizing investor return. Candidly, it does. Investors put money in to see a business, an organization, a group of people add value to the marketplace. And um, understandably, you're beholden to honor that commitment, that investment, and do everything you can to maximize the return. So it starts there. First goal is maximize the return to investors. So what we had to do then was think about how do we best maximize return? Were we a technology company wanting to sell our intellectual property rights 
to a patented set of technologies, that opens up a whole different aperture for who the potential acquirers are. And that wasn't who we were. We had some really interesting, powerful, complicated technology under the hood. Not quite enough to generate a, a valuation and a multiple to meet the investor expectations. So we looked at it and said, we have an operating business that relies on the current set and a growing set of customers that all look alike. And so how do we best support ourselves, build a foundation for a handoff through a sale that our customers, current customers and the future ones, are going to continue to trust and invest in the business that SellPoints is selling. We weren't selling our technology and RP and our, our patents, et cetera. We were selling the growth of our core business and that relationship with customer base that was, that was going to continue to grow. So that was one of the first hurdles we went through to understand what was our best path, the technology and IP or the customer base and how that would grow. Yeah. I mean, customer success and the deal actually go hand in hand because the confidence in the buyers, you know, belief that post deal customers will stick around, uh, is, is critical and can be critical to some of the valuation metrics post deal, which we'll talk about a little bit later. In my process, I went so far as to read in a couple of our customers that the process was happening, the ones that I felt could handle the information because I wanted them to actually help me sell the company. Did you, you, did you employ this, a similar tactic? With some of our most strategic partners, we needed to. Um, so yes, a little bit later in the process. Yeah. For sure. So we, we followed, we followed a rule of more um, inference early mm -hmm. on. Some yeah. of the customers look, cell points was founded, I believe back in 2002 and the process we're talking about concluded in August of 2019, August yes. 8th, 8, 8, I remember exactly. 8, 8, 19. It was very emotional in the, uh, in the, in, in the room when the deal was signed, but um, you know, for 17 years, cell points had relationships with some customers. So we had enough information to make the decision that the sale uh, would be the right move for them. And then towards the end of the process, but before we were done, they were certainly led into the discussion yeah. to really check ourselves. And for the acquirer too, the acquirer wanted to hear from those referenced customers that everything was going to be all right and that they would be staying on board and get a real temperature check on the business. And that's a normal part of the process. Acquirers coming in to buy your customer base and how it's going to grow, they're going to want to see and hear firsthand from some of those customers that they're going to stay on and why. Exactly. So who, who was the team? Obviously you didn't do all this stuff yourself. What was the team that you built around you to support this process? Yeah. And, and I think as a, as an operator who's leading the process, uh, you're sort of, um, you're sort of just right in the middle of the herd and there's a big herd around you. That, that is, that is the mindset you have to have. You're, you're there to support and serve everyone around you and get you across the finish line. So for me, uh, you know, there was the operating board, the parent company operating board, um, that had ownership stake and control of the company to sign off on decisions. Um, so, so that was critical. And thankfully that operating board, um, uh, had on it some really seasoned, um, attorneys cause I'm not one. Uh, so some seasoned attorneys and, and some terrific former bankers who were a part of the team. So they were critical, not only strategically, but frankly, they were so critical tactically and mechanically drafting, revising valuation assessments, all of it. You have to find those resources if you're not going to come, uh, it's not going to come with a plug and play from an investment bank uh, or, or an M&A bank. It's, it's not there. You have to find that. So the operating board of the parent company, critical. Um, you mentioned something earlier about the emotional, um, the emotional paradigms of running a sale while running a business. Yeah. You know, for any operating uh, leader, president, CEO, or otherwise that's going through this, your executive coach or your commercial therapist Incredibly important. Absolutely. You don't want to spend all your time up in your brain by yourself. That's not a safe place to be for most people, certainly not for me during that process. So you need to also have an independent party, executive coach, commercial therapist to make sure that's there. And he was, he was wonderfully helpful in ensuring that I kept balance. And then, um, you know, all my functional leaders. So at sell points, head of finance and HR and product engineering, customer success, marketing, you know, that, that leadership team critically involved. You know, there's such a part of the process and frankly, such a part of the commitment in the sale to be on board, to help shape it and to be part of the committee that moves things forward. So operating board, um, executive coach and, uh, and my leadership team. Uh, and I'd say lastly, just a, a critical mentor of mine who was an advisor who actually brokered the initial introduction 
um, that I've known for almost 15 years or so. Uh, another independent third party outside of an executive coach who's been through dozens of M&A transactions um, and was familiar with the company. So that was that was the tight team, aside from my family and, and friends keeping me down. Yeah, of course. Did you um, read in anybody that was below the executive ranks at any point during the process that probably there's like a really new experience for them? Early on uh, in the process and through most of it, we needed to make sure that our team could stay focused. You know, we needed to operate a business in a challenging marketplace and continue to hit our quarterly, monthly, daily goals as a team. And, uh, you know, one of the drivers, frankly, of the sale uh, was that we didn't have uh, extra cash laying around. We needed to be incredibly efficient with our minutes to value, our minutes to um, ACV or ARR. And so we kept our operating team, the frontline team members and our managers really focused on the day to day. Towards the end of the process, similar to some of the large customers that we brought in towards the end, that, that's when we brought in some, some of our managers and certainly our team members. Um, I think there are some archetypes of founder, CEO, what have you, that um, don't sit well with big secrets and they like to go beyond their leadership team to like their, their favorite AE, their favorite customer success or sales champion and say, Hey, I just want to read you in on something. Yeah. Um, sometimes for a reason that may be well intended and sometimes just because they want to share and it's, you have to be really measured about that decision because the moment you do it, you have told that person there is a risk. They won't have a job in 90 days. That's the first thing that comes to mind. Will my job be secure? That's right. Will the company that buys us keep me? Like all of these questions and that, and what you were talking about there is the distraction, the good intent of wanting to be transparent. Uh, you have to balance with the principle of limiting distractions of the team at a time where you're trying to maximize value for everybody else at the table, including the employees. You, you know, you mentioned something there, Christian, about, um, you know, th there's usually a reason. So you got to really understand what the reason is. I remember wanting to do that because there were, I mean, I, I chuckled, as you said, favorite AE, favorite marketing coordinator, favorite AP specialist, right? Because they're there. And some of them have been, some of them, I was at Cell Points for just over two years or so. And some have been there for a decade. Yeah. And so the emotional, psychological need that presented itself to me to, to bring in some other folks, I had to. I went through it. It's natural to go through that and stop and say, what is the cost benefit? Why am I, why am I bringing them? And do I need them to help with fill in the blank, the valuation, the outreach, the positioning? Is it something that my leadership team, operating board, coach, advisor aren't providing? If it is, then I would recommend you bring that individual over into the camp of that core team. But whole, wholesale, that never happened because of what, what you just described. I never needed to bring that favorite seasoned, experienced frontline team member into the discussion. The fear, uncertainty, and doubt, the distraction, yeah. the risk to them being able to do their job, the risk to the deal. I mean, we're all people. Information is powerful and, and everyone might know minutes later. And, and, and then, then that's, a, that's a wildfire of distraction. So your, your points are there. It's keep the camp. You have to keep the camp really, really tight really tough. And that's yeah. okay. You're not hiding. It's not a secret. You really are um, building that communication framework for the benefit of the company to survive and thrive. And that's, that's, that's the goal. Yeah. Now I give different advice to f founders when they call me with a, a four or five person business. We're not talking about a four or five person business. We're saying like any size over like 15, 20, yeah. like yeah. the, it's different. Like if you're all on a boat together and you can all fit on a boat of fives, then it's one thing y'all need to be read in. But if, if there's people with parts and roles and it's a little bit more distributed, that's probably dividing line. I know people will say, I saw you on TikTok and you said this, I, let's, let's call the difference between the two. So yes. the next thing that I would like to walk through, John, is the process in of itself. I describe this work to many as very similar to an enterprise selling process. Mm -hmm. The only difference is uh, there's only, you only got one end to sell and, and instead of having, you know, a, a shelf full of things, you've got one. And so in selling this one thing, you have to run a really tightly coordinated process to maximize value and outcome 
and the right experience for everybody. So, you know, as best as you can, could you sort of describe in your words, the phases of the process? How did yeah. you run it? Yeah, first, great question. So first, and this is really deliberate and needed to be, from my perspective, very linear. So the first step was um, ensuring that we could strip down or focus explicitly on what our highest and best value proposition was going to be for years to come. Really take a look at not what we thought we wanted to be back in 2005, not what we thought we had a shot at back in 2015, but in 2019, what were we, what were we going to be? So we really beat up on ourselves a tight strategic reframe. Look, we're getting ready to come in and, and do a red team, blue team exercise on what do we really have that's defensible? Not to inspire our employees, not to inspire our customers, but to really open up the, the hood and, and show who we are uh, to someone else. So that strategic frame was important. Then we went to the second part of the process. Okay. What are the types? I'm going to say types is a, is, a, is a loose term. What are the types of acquiring organizations that are going to relate to that value and why? And some of those happen to be in the, the retail media space because there was a value proposition there. Some happen to be in the, in the retail space, retailers specifically. And some happen to be um, in, in adjacent near neighbor businesses like Syndigo, content syndication, publication analytics, et cetera. But we looked at uh, and prioritized a handful of categories of companies, narrowed it down to three that were most viable. Next step, prepare for and activate your outreach. It's like an enterprise sale. So now, you know, you, you turn into a BDR and SDR and, and, and you're really triangulating as an enterprise sale is a great example, Christian. You're triangulating your best entry point, building up a coalition, building up some side channel and, and back channel inertia to make sure that you get with limited time and threading the needle, make sure you maximize your chance of having the right discussion at the right time with the right team. And that's a team effort, advisor, operating board, coach, lieutenants, partners, really tapping into the network um, at that point. So when you decide who you are, the company um, types that are gonna be most viable, and then you've activated your, your outreach and your positioning, um, then you go to the roadshow, right? That's all the work that would get done by a bank at some point. And then they say, here's your script, hit the road. Then that, that next phase is go hit the road where you fly around. Um, and at that point it was pre COVID. So we were able to fly and, and go to offices and sit down and, and actually have the discussions in person. Um, and we did all this from the spring of 2019 through August of 2019. It was, it was a, it was a five month process. We thought about it. The decision to sell to sell was about a five month process. I, I always talk about this when people call me for advice, like this is not getting done in 60 days, no matter how simple you think it is. It's the decision, the setting up the process for success and the actual going and doing. And the vast majority of acquirers require at a minimum 60 days, but usually 90 and sometimes even longer than that to package it all up internally do the models, get clarity, do the confirmatory diligence on the business to make sure that everything is true, depending on how conservative the business is to get it through. The stories you hear about companies that acquire things in 30 days, like those are teams and teams of people that cost hundreds of thousands of dollars and most acquirers cannot pull that off. So a four or five month end to end process is very, very typical. I love that you called it out. The other thing that I that you called out subtly and I want to highlight is multi-threading your likely targets. Um, when I was selling my company to Channel Advisor, the targets that I worked were a couple of the trusted insider, like senior sales people who I knew would influence the CEO's decision-making because what I knew was, you know, CEOs have a lot in front of them and they're always sort of in doubt of, even if they want, say they want to be acquisitive, they're in doubt most of the time, they have to be convinced. If you get a champion inside the business to champion the case for why better together, that multi-threading, um, very selective multi-threading, but that multi-threading makes it so much easier for you to open a line and get a stage in front of the leadership team and make the case for why better together and get them excited to put the best offer forward. Always appreciate um, a positive can-do 
uh, attitude. And, and so try to embody that. But I will go to the flip side of this coin too, which says we, we had some potential companies who we thought would be good fits, just like happens in an enterprise sale. We knew that there were some embedded key stakeholders at that organization who didn't have the rosiest picture and representation of who cell points was. And so those, so likewise, those agents that were inside those potential acquiring companies, we knew were going to be insurmountable roadblocks if yeah. and when the CEO went to their lieutenant to say, what do you all think about cell points? And so you got to look at both sides, right? Do you have those yeah. senior sales leaders, commercial leaders, operating leaders that can help support, you know, really support, uh, you know, the proposition and likewise, you know, make sure that you don't have any um, landmines because they exist. They exist. Your duty is to make sure that the process is known to the CEO or CFO of a potential acquirer. And if you don't have confidence that if you believe there's a detractor in the business, then it's it's a signal for you on where to spend time. Sales reps have to decide. I got five opportunities this quarter. What are the one or two that I'm going to focus on to hit my number? It's, it's the same. It's the same process. It's slightly higher stakes uh, and you know, slightly different dynamics, but not terribly dissimilar. You identified the, we, it's now out in public, Syndigo was, mm. was the acquirer. Um, how, did you, how did you arrive at like, this was the right home for this company? What were sort of like, help, help the listener understand a bit of the criteria that made you say, this is the right thing for the company, right by the customers, right by the employees, right by the investors. Um. Hindsight's 2020 and, and um, couldn't have been more thrilled that it wound up being Syndigo. Um, you know, even through today, the number of team members that are still at Syndigo is, is, uh, is terrific to see. So uh, it, was, it was such a natural fit. Syndigo at the time was solving the problem that we were continuing to see every day in the marketplace. At Cell Points, we offered a couple of laser-focused solutions that solved some of a customer's problem. That customer was being presented with near neighbor adjacent, similar lookalike solutions uh, every day. And Syndigo at the time was starting its inorganic uh, growth journey. Syndigo at this point now has acquired, I believe, 14 entities since being formed in 2017. So 14 Over entities. Six years. I think that's about right. Six, yeah. seven years, about 14 entities. I think we were the eighth or ninth at the time. And so they, they were on the short list early on because they were highly acquisitive. So you need that timeline to work. You need, when you're selling a company, you need to find acquirers who are very much in the mode of buying. Not might Absolutely. be, not might be, but are in the mode. That is one of the, first, it can be the best idea in the world, but if the, it's like budget authority need and timeline. If the timeline and the budget aren't there, the need might be there and the, the power might be there, but if the money and the timing isn't aligned, it doesn't matter. So that was one that, that made a lot of sense. Now, if they were a manufacturing company, I don't know if the sale would have had the same valuation, but they happened to be in the same business. They wanted to put together the best and the brightest of the point solutions that existed in the marketplace, bring it together to create a more seamless, effective proposition for the customer. So we were aligned not only in terms of Deal mechanics and resources and energy and timing had to happen. We were also aligned strategically in how we thought about the customer and the customer value. And then I'll say culturally. I mean, we were based out here in, in, uh, in Emeryville, in the Bay Area. Uh, and Syndigo at the time was headquartered pre-COVID, uh, primarily in Chicago, a bit in Nashville and, and Wisconsin. Um, but culturally, things just meshed really well. You know, we flew out to their office quite a bit. They flew out to ours a bit. And... Uh, that's an important point of this. Will the personalities, will the people, will the alchemy work? Spreadsheets don't run companies, right? People you run do. companies and, and, and you do it together. So, you know, deal term uh, synergy, strategic synergy, and then, and then the cultural synergy, that all continued to flow. And by the way, it flowed with one to two other um, suitors, I'll say. Uh, but ultimately, there's decisions around valuation, uh, and the actual ability to sign at the right timeline that, you know, wound up pointing us to Syndigo. That's that's actually a great call out going back to our enterprise sales rep play, right? Need, willingness, ability, cash, cash on hand, available to do do the deal. Yeah. You can have need 
and you can have sort of like, yeah, I, I want to do a deal, but do you have the ability to actually transact? Yeah. Um, that, that piece is those pieces, you know, so tightly flow to flow together. Um, one of yeah. the, one of the other things about the process that I think we should get out, um, here is kind of the idea that some of the deal terms hmm. will require the company to perform in a hmm. certain way after the deal when the operator, the, the, the investors are no longer in control. So maybe you could pontificate a little bit on kind of a couple of the example things that you had to sign up for that were like, well, I just have to really have trust this acquirer is going to help set us up for success because I could, I could want for all these things to happen, but they could theoretically disrupt it. And, you yep. know, give you an example term that we always hear about is like earnouts, like you have to achieve certain targets in order to get a full payment. Like the company yep. could take all your marketing and sales dollars away. No acquirer really wants to do that because they want you to achieve your goals. But I mean, what are the kind of example um, things you had to sign up for post deal that were like required you to perform? One of the things I appreciate about the process with Syndigo and we did seasoned acquirers, seasoned M and A team on that side of the table. And as I mentioned, yes. our operating board similarly yep. had great experience. And so there's some, there's some really straightforward reasonable approaches to, to that post acquisition term. So, um, and I'll divulge whatever I can, of course, here to the listeners at home. Um, first of all, you want to keep the team in place. So when the deal's done, you're going to want to set up and be expected to set up terms that, that keep your key team members embedded at the organization. So that's straightforward and put your, put your earnout clauses in there. So you've got your call it six months where the leadership team is active, staying in place, giving all their best commercially reasonable efforts to drive the business. That's a, that's a table stakes. As we said, people have to run the business. So an acquirer can't expect people to leave. That's, that's honestly, that's the most important, right? If, if you're, if your key operating leaders are bought in and are committed to that, you know, couple of quarter process at a minimum, that's really important. They have the IP, they understand the culture, the customers, the business, and they're going to be excited and motivated. Beyond that, you know, we had some, we had some expectations. Um, first of all, that Syndigo was really going to let us, by and large, run the business independently for the six months or so um, after the acquisition. To not muck about, throw things off, get involved, and, and do things that didn't. It, Syndigo understood our business as well as we understood it. And wanted to just see it continue to operate successfully after the acquisition rather than announce the acquisition and really start to change the mechanics. So we had this level of independence, if you will. Um, and that was important. And then lastly, we did have some expectations around how we would perform in terms of both top line revenue and, uh, and mitigating, say, churn and loss. Yep. Um, and they were reasonable. There weren't expectations to 2x the business after the acquisition or maintain a you know, 108% uh, NRR, they were reasonable, but they were important. So I, th I think the important thing is, is these asks are normal course and you do just sort of have to have trust. I mean, you're, 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 you're getting, to, you're, you're coming together and it's a trust game. Um, if you hmm. start, first of all, you have to trust the people you're doing business with business with that is a judgment call. Second of all, uh, you just have to operate from the point of, I believe these things are going to happen. You, you'll never be able to legally write your way through like forcing compliance one way or the other, which yeah. I think some people try to do. Like you will agree not to cut marketing spend by X dollars. You will agree to keep my favorite sales reps in order. To, these things are not going to happen. Yeah. Uh, what you're going to get is a mutual, you know, there's usually clauses like um, commercially reasonable efforts, you know, like there's terminology legal, but at the end of the day, they can let go of your favorite rep and they can cut the marketing budget if they don't think it, it's merited for the business. These are the risks that you have to face going into the process, but it's a part of that trust relationship you're building when you're trying to decide who's your right, who's the right partner for the company. Yep. Trust drives so much of the process, so much of it. Um, and that, that I put under that, that cultural dynamic and that cultural dimension, there was that trust. We knew who we each knew who we were. Um, we respected each other and we wanted the best outcome for shared investors uh, on both sides and, uh, and customers. And, uh, you know, after the, after the acquisition and the integration, when I'd gone off into ag tech, 
uh, I was happy to come back home, so to speak, and work with that Syndigo team again. So the last couple of years have been, uh, have been terrific. Um, trusted team there. That's awesome. All right. Everyone's favorite question. What was signing and closing like? Signing and closing day, they were simultaneous. I need a beta blocker. Um, you know, you run the race for five months and uh, anybody who's gone through the process knows how many things come up during that process that could have thrown the deal sideways a dozen times, no hyperbole. And so you're there on signing day and you're just waiting and you're just on watch for something to, to maybe pop up. Um, so vigilant, coordinating. We had attorneys in uh, Hawaii time zone uh, over through Nantucket. It was the middle of summer. It was the middle of summer. So we literally had Hawaii to, I believe it was Nantucket. Um, and so we had uh, attorneys uh, and deal folks coordinated that final day, making sure everything was ready to go. Uh, the deal signed just before close of business uh, East Coast on August 8th. Um, and then as the deal closed and everyone uh, everyone signed off and agreed verbally and, and electronically, uh, it was just a moment of extreme uh, calm and surreal sort of peace um, that it had happened. And we all just sat. Um, it wasn't as though we just launched a, a rocket to Mars. <laughs> uh, we didn't cure any uh, any terrible disease. We, 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 we wound up successfully completing this M&A transaction, but to us, for the team that were a part of it, it felt, it felt like we had done something monumental. So that, that day you're on edge and when it closes and, and signs, um, there's an extreme, uh, relief and peace and, and serenity, um, until, yeah, I identify until with Monday or Tuesday when you're back and you've got to now, get yeah, now we got to go do, but enjoy, yeah. enjoy those 24 to, to, you know, 72, uh, hours and, and make sure to thank everybody who was a part of the journey. Make sure to, to, to reconnect with all the folks from month one through month five of that process that played supporting roles along the way, not just part of the core team. And that's, uh, that's, that's, that's important. That's, yeah, that's absolutely. Sure. And take care of the people who, who helped you get, um, get there and whatever way is, is, is the right way yeah, you bet. in, in hindsight, like, Looking back on it, were you to do it all over again, what's the one or two things you would do different? Things that we could do different, I could do different um, that were feasible to do different. Um, probably narrow down the list of, of acquiring companies a little bit sharper, a little bit sooner. So we talk all the time in sales management about uh, happy years, so to speak. I think we contained happy years. I probably could have saved a teeny bit more time. Ultimately, we probably arrive at the same destination. Um, but we would have burned a little less fuel uh, on, on some of the engagements, uh, hoping that they would happen. So just even stricter and sharper on the budget authority need timeline qualification process. Um, that's one. I think that's the biggest one. That's the yeah. biggest one. I think um, I would say ask for more help, but I'd learned in, I'd learned in lessons previously with some of my scar tissue and, and gray hair. Um, it takes a village. So even when it's DIY, you know, assemble the team together. I've been a part of transactions that didn't happen uh, or happened in ways that were a little bit bumpier and bruisier. Um, so, you know, you can't, uh, you can't underestimate how important it is to put that team together in the right way, which I think we all did a great job of coming together. But uh, I, I think the thing that I would, I would add is in a DIY process, there's not the banker's role. And the reason why they get paid what they do is they are orchestrating a lot of lawyers, a lot of advisors on all the different sides and kind of they're playing a role of project management. And especially in the last 10 days, there's, you know, mm -hmm. knit, knit knacks all over all of the legal documents, missing documents, questions. There's just a lot of things that are outstanding. But when these, when you get to a, de a definitive agreement to, to clean, that last sort of 10 yards is a lot of, of cleanup. Um, one of the tactics I employ as a, as a deal runner and that I ran um, when I was doing my own deals is last seven to 10 days, you just have a 30 minute call with all the interested parties and tick list. What's broken? What's missing? What needs to be yeah. fixed? Are we aligned? Like make sure you drive towards those next steps. Same way you're running an enterprise sales process. If it takes a call every day for 15 to 30 minutes to just make sure everyone aligned and keeps moving forward and the email traffic isn't getting knotted up on some yeah. missing document that's sitting on someone's hard drive and they're on vacation, like let's figure it out. Um, 
that project management is incredibly important in getting the deal over the line. Couldn't agree more. Yeah, you're out of strategy, you're out of valuation, you're out of negotiation, you're into uh, in the medic framework. I mean, you're really into detailed daily document yeah. administration management. And there are with a with a 17 young 17 year young company and multiple parties involved on both sides. The documentation mountain is is meaningful and getting it all right um, takes a lot. You're right. Great call out that last week or so is uh, brings me back to the days of being a gopher in a law firm back in New York when I was in high school. It is just copy, staple, sign, scan, send, and make sure everybody's uh, everybody's on the same page. Yeah. Well, John, this has been a fantastic conversation. Thank you so much for coming on to Inorganic. Yeah, thanks for having me, Christian. Good to see you, man. Yeah, really appreciated um, the story. Congratulations on, on all of your success. And to you, our listeners, I want to thank you for joining us for this episode of Inorganic. If you enjoyed the conversation, please help us out by giving a like, a subscribe, and maybe a share out to someone who might not know about our podcast. Until the next time, we'll see you.